you look in the mirror, what do you see? I hope for some of us when we look in the mirror, especially after last week, and if you weren't here last week, each of these weeks as we talk about this are unbelievably important, so go online and listen or grab a DVD at the bookstore. But, but as, as we think about what God did and who he created us to be, I hope that some of you, as you look in the mirror, and maybe for the first time as you've just been exposed to this and started to think about it, you see an amazing creation of God. I, I hope that's what some of us see, or at least we can grow in that direction. And, and today, what I want us to think about is, is this. Um, for, for some of us, what we see and what our experience has been is we see someone who is frail and who has fallen. Is that not true? We know us better than anyone knows us. And so when we look at ourselves in the mirror, have you ever done that where you, you, someone takes a picture of you or you like walk past a mirror and you're like, ah, right? Like, who's that? And everyone else is like, well, uh, that's you. That's what you look like. And you're like, I didn't think I looked like that. You know, I mean, we have this image in our own minds. And, and so some of us may think then, well, okay, so I'm an amazing creation of God and he made me to be... Uh, just as I'm supposed to be, and yet I'm frail and I've fallen. So is, is this schizophrenic? Well, we have to start in the beginning. We always have to start in the beginning because that shows us what the intent was and who we were supposed to be. But we also have to deal with the problem, don't we? This is unbelievably important because God made us to be these amazing creations but we've fallen. And we're not who he intended for us to be in the beginning. And so what in the world can we do about this? How, how do we address this? Because I think like the video we just watched, what happens for some of us is, is, you know, we feel like, yeah, I know my deficiencies. I know what happens when I wake up and my family interacts and we fight. But like that family no one else sees that, and when we get there and we're fist bumping everybody and kind of whoop whooping, um, everyone's like, hey, this family's got it, some, or this person's got it somewhat together. And so we feel like even though things have been messed up, we can work hard enough, we can cover it up enough so that it's okay. And no matter how young or old you are, no matter how able or incapacitated you have fallen, and you can't get up. And sin is the culprit. Sin is what causes this. So as we think about sin, and you know, a lot of times in the church, you know, like sin's kind of a, an interesting term or idea, because like you're supposed to almost say it like sin, right? Because it's like, it's ominous. And there's some churches say, well, let's, I actually remember talking to a youth group one time, and before I went there, uh, the, the people who were the youth sponsors said, just please don't talk about sin, death, or hell. Because we don't want you to scare the kids. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> so we're more worried about scaring people than we are about telling truth? Like, uh, it's just kind of weird to me. But the, the idea of sin, there's a number of images here. And the first one, as we think about sin and how sin causes brokenness and fallenness in us, the, the first picture is missing the mark, and this is kind of an archery term, you know, where, where you take your best shot, and, you know, if you don't hit the mark, you've missed it a little bit. So, so even giving our best effort, we're still a little bit off. If, is, can, has anyone ever done that? I did my best, and I still missed the mark. We, we know that sort of feeling of sin. And, and then it, it gets bigger. It's not just missing the mark. There's this sense of willful disobedience. I, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't want to do that. You know, the, the thing I want to do is, is different. And so, no, I will not do what you've asked me to do. Um, and really, when it comes right down to it, the essence of sin is not so much that it's this big bad thing like murder. Uh, that's sin too. But the essence of sin is when we want to do it a way other than God's way. 
when God says this is the way, this is right, and we go, nah, I think my way is better. And what arrogance is that? I mean, let's think about this. And, and you've seen people say this and think this? You have said this and thought this. I have, have said this and thought this. How can God know better than me for my life? He's God. He knit you together. He gives you breath. Of course he knows better than you for your life. The scripture tells us this in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. Not just some of us. Not even most of us. The scripture says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And like I told you last week, I want to teach you that you can and how to hear from God. And so each of these steps is really important. Last week it was all about how his plan and his design for us all was perfect. It wasn't messed up. When we kind of came off the divine assembly line, God didn't go, yeah, close enough. It, no, no, no. He, who we are, who he made us to be was perfect. And, and then today, I want you to get this idea that there is nobody who escapes sin or is less tainted. Because we think this, don't we? Uh, when, when we want to hear from God, you need to know why this is important not to pass the buck. Because sometimes we do this. I really want to know what you want, God. I really want to know what you want. Hey, Rob, what does God want for me? Well, I can tell you what I want for you. And I can give you some ideas, some general ideas of what God may want for you. And, and, but hear me here. It's not like, I wish it was, but it's not. It's not like you guys are really sinful and broken, and I'm a little bit less sinful and broken. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work the way that some people are sinners and some people aren't. Some people, you know... Uh, struggle with sin their whole life, and others of us are just above that. It would be great because we love the idea of going to someone else who's arrived who can tell us what to do. And the reason I think most of the times all of us seek that kind of relationship is because we don't want to take responsibility for our own lives. We don't want to take responsibility for our own actions because if someone else tells us what to do and we do that and it doesn't work, we can say, they told me to. It's their fault. We can pass the buck yet again. I am bad and you are better? No. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, Father, today as we spend a few minutes thinking some thoughts together and, and considering the, the idea of sin, I just pray that, that you would speak to us. God, I pray that, that we would think about how we've all struggled with living life, not the way you've asked us to do, but the way that we want to. And God, I pray that today, whether it's a scripture or a story or a thought or an idea, that you would help all of us to see the error of that kind of thinking and that kind of living. God, help us to experience and know you in some powerful ways today because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Check out this video. Who has sinned? How many have sinned? All have sinned. Every single one of us. And it's interesting because when we look at the scriptures, remember what happens in Genesis chapter 1? Everything's created and it's what? It's good. And then when God looks specifically at us and all of creation, what does he say? It is very good. So in chapter 1, things are very good. And in Genesis chapter 3, Everything falls apart, right? 
everything comes crashing down. And so in Genesis 3, we see this perfect relationship, this perfect relationship with God, walking in, in the garden with God in the cool of the day, this beautiful picture of a perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with creation, perfect relationship with each other. Uh, and, and it's beautiful. There's this perfect relationship. There's perfect fellowship. And, and I love this. You can say amen if you want. Uh, everyone was naked and felt no shame. Amen. Amen. And I don't mean that sexually. I mean, like, how many of us, when we're naked, even if we're by ourselves, there's, we're, you know, I need a diet. We, we feel shame, right? And this all ends. It all ends. It comes crashing down. And it, it, I don't know about you guys, anytime I read this, think about this study, it just drives me nuts. Because they had one rule, right? Don't eat from the fruit of this one tree. That's it. That's the only rule. And I've said this to you before, but I think it bears repeating. I mean, if that's the case, what should we do, right? Because it seemed like, oh, did he really say, oh, it's just so pretty. Oh, I, the, the, that fruit looks juicy. It's like a ripe peach in the middle of summer. Oh, right? But maybe, I know we're not supposed to, and we're not gonna. Of course we're not, of course we're not gonna. But maybe we could, like, put some lawn chairs underneath that tree and just kind of let it hang. And fr- don't we? We do this, don't we? I mean, the one thing we're not supposed to do, or the one thing we're tempted to do, we, we kind of cozy up to it. I, I would never do that. But it just looks so stinking good. Uh, a friend of mine said it like this. The Christian life is not about being, uh, seeing how close we can get to sin before we fall, but it's about seeing how close we can get to God before we explode. And how many of us live life seeing how close we can get to that stinking piece of forbidden fruit before we actually stumble and fall? And, and then we say this, don't we? I'm not hurting anyone. Or we say it this way, I, I, I'm, I'm just hurting myself. Let's look at the next chapter, because Adam and Eve make this decision for themselves and together, right? So, and it's no big deal, right? I, I'm not hurting anyone. Or if I'm hurting anyone, it's just me. It, but then in Genesis 4, right after this happens, in Genesis 4, just listen to these words. I'm just going to read four verses Uh, Verse 4 through 8, it says this. In the course of time, Cain, uh, Adam and Eve that we know have had three children. Cain and Abel were the first two, these boys, and then they had Seth later on. So here we go. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits from the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Do you see the little difference there? It's like, okay, so so Cain... uh, had, had uh, fruit and, and things that grew from the ground, and he brought some of that. Here, God, here. Um, didn't say he brought the best. He just brought some, gave it to God. And then when Abel brings uh, some livestock, you see he brings the firstborn, the choice. That he brings the best and gives the best of what he has to God. Um, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. This is just a beautiful picture of sin, isn't it? We do the thing and then we're mad at everybody else. Why do we do that? God, God, I want you to treat me the same as you treat that person who honors you way more with their life. Huh. Doesn't happen that way. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now, so here we go, right? Here's the solution. Cain's mad because God looked with favor upon what Abel gave, but not on what he gave because he kind of half-heartedly did this thing. And so God says, hey, just do what's right and it'll be cool. If you, if you just do what you're supposed to do, things will be great. And so you would think the logical thing, if you weren't fallen and broken and frail, would be to what? 
Do the right thing, right? Do your best. Make it happen. But he comes up with a different plan. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. (laughs) What? But go online, read the paper, watch the news, and we see the same things happening over and over and over again. Instead of living right, we, we don't. So the door is open to sin, and sin is on the move, isn't it? So we see everything's perfect in one and two. Everything's created and good. In chapter three, everything falls, and it's like, oh, it's, but it's just us, right? It's just Adam and Eve. The next chapter, one of their kids kills the other one because of jealousy. And, and then in chapter five, we're not going to talk about that because basically it's just an overview of, of the time from Adam to Noah. But then in Genesis chapter six, in Genesis six, I just want to read you one verse because here we go from chapter three through chapter six, this time passes and we go from, it was just us. It's not hurting anyone or it's just hurting us. And then we see this spread to now it's our kids that sin is affecting and, and one of them isn't with us anymore because of sin. And, and just in the next um, chapter, we see this. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, here's what the scripture says. The Lord saw how great the man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that, don't miss this, every, not some, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Woo! We had just become awesome, hadn't we? And so sometimes we say, Adam and Eve, how could you mess this one up for us? How could you eat the fruit? But as my theology professor would always say, when he was a kid, there was the neighbor's strawberry patch that he would sneak over to when they weren't home or under the cover of darkness and gorge on strawberries. And I don't know what it was for you. I know what it was for me. I don't know what it was for you. But if it wasn't them, it would have been us, right? Because sin is on the move, and it, wasn't, it doesn't just affect us. It affects absolutely everything. All have sinned, and this disease affects Everyone, check out this video. At the end of Genesis 3, we see these words in verse 24. It says, After God drove Adam and Eve out of the place called the Garden of Eden, um, on the east side of the Garden of Eden, uh, cherubim, angels, Uh, and a flaming sword were placed, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So see, what happens is they sin, they fall. And God, this isn't uh, just a punishment. This is a protection as well. Because they've they've sinned, uh, because things are broken, God says if they eat of the tree of life now and they live forever, they'll sort of be stuck with this. So it's like you, you can't eat of this after you've eaten of that. But we have this picture, don't we? This picture um, of, of being east of Eden. So everything's moving. The, there's this fall and there's this movement to the east of Eden. And God's protecting this east side of Eden. Uh, Steinbeck wrote a great book, great work entitled East of Eden. It's all about the, the fallenness of humanity. So sin is on the move, not again, but continually. And the metaphor here is that it's moving east. So I just, I'm going to have a little fun for a second. I want to show you a picture of our country. Which side is, which side, which way is west? Point? Yeah? And east, this way? So sort of the move, moving east. I'm going to show you a compass here so you can even orient it even more, right? So that side is east. The movement east in this metaphor is like the, the falling apart or the movement towards sin. So one more picture for those of you who cheered for the wrong team last week. <laughs> That's on, it was on the east side of our country. Okay, good enough. Uh, You know, maybe we ought to have a moment of silence if some of you need to repent. I don't know, I'm just saying. So so sin, the the idea of moving east or being east of Eden is all about sin is in motion. 
And not only from one person to everyone, but, but starting from one point and moving everywhere. Think about it like this. It, sin starts in a personal way, and then it moves out and gets bigger. It's a, then it becomes a societal thing. And, and then finally, it becomes systemic. It, it actually becomes part of the system. Uh, again, we're, we're all fallen. We live in a fallen uh, world. So it's from me to everyone to everywhere. It's part of the system. Sometimes in the church, we talk about it as original sin or the first separation. We're separated from God. In this separation, this brokenness, this fallenness continues from this point and, and goes everywhere. Check out this video. All the guys are going, amen. Huh? Come on. I, you know, oh, no, 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 we'd never do that. Yeah, right. I mean, come on. Uh, it's, it's a problem. It, it looks good, right? I mean, in, in the garden, that was the problem. What it, it, we sometimes read it in such a clinical way, but it's like, oh, the, the, food, the fruit was, was beautiful. It, it looked good. And it's, it's nice and smooth, Right? Oh, and it looks, so it looks good. It will feel good. Have you ever heard this? Have you ever said this? It can't hurt just this one time. Just this little bit. Remember Genesis 3? It, we'll, we'll just have one bite. We'll just have one piece. And everything goes to hell. It's called Temptation. And we all know what this looks like and feels like. We all know what it's like to, to have something that looks good. That we think or know will feel good. That we just will do a little bit. Just a, not, you know, not even enough to really get involved with it. <laughs> As though we could control this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says this. No temptation has seized you except what is common. Now let's think about that for a second. Is that cool? In our sophistication, we translate this as, well, it's no big deal. After all, everybody struggles with it. It's everywhere. I mean, there's nowhere we can look where this isn't happening. So in our wisdom and sophistication, we think, hey, this is common. It's cool. You're broken. I'm broken. We're all broken together. Woohoo! But no. Because see what happens after this. So we, we, can, we can talk about our sin. We can talk about our temptation because it's a common thing. It's not like you're broken and I'm not, or I'm, I'm, I'm broken and you're not. But what does the text say as we continue? And God is faithful. Love that. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Isn't this cool? God says that these two things, these two promises, right? One, we won't be tempted beyond what we can bear. Oh, I just have to give in. The weight of temptation is so crushing. Well, of course it is if you're standing under the stupid tree. He won't let... Now, sometimes we let ourselves become tempted beyond what we can bear. Amen? Amen? Um, but God won't do this. And when we are tempted, he always, the text says, provides an escape route. So, so let's do something. Can we do something together here? Say, the, say these words with me. Ready? Stop it. Now, what I want you to do, and if you're here with somebody who you know, like you live in the same uh, family, maybe turn the other way because you have to go home together and it might be embarrassing. But uh, so if there's a stranger or someone you don't know that well, I want you to turn to them and just look them in the eyes and say, stop it. Can you do that, please? Don't spit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now what I want you to do, did somebody spit on someone? Is that why there's laughter? That's bad. Um, now what I want you to do is I want you, as you're sitting there, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to pretend 
like there's, there's nobody in this room except for you. You're, just, you're here with God, okay? And can you do me a favor? Will you just say this to yourself? Stop it. Do it, do it. Loud, come on. Did everyone do it? If, if, if we have a few more than need to, come on. <laughs> All right, the, the, the two that didn't did. All right, there we go. Um, so here's the thing. We do this all the time. We think we're smart enough. We think we're strong enough. We think we can figure it out. We think we can handle it. And God is sitting there going, look, I'm not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Stop allowing yourself to be tempted in that way. He, he's saying, I'm providing a way out. Take it. Stop living so close to sin like that. Stop flirting with temptation because it only ever results in bad things. Check out this video. You know the thing that tempts you. Maybe you know the thing that you struggle with and you think you got it under control. And so what's our tendency with our temptation that we're dabbling with or messing around with? Isn't our tendency to want to keep it a secret? Huh? Anyone know what this is like? Anyone ever done this? I'm putting my hand up because I have. Anyone ever done this? Where you're doing something you know you shouldn't and, and you don't want people to know. If we start dabbling with sin, the tendency is to hide it and keep it a secret. And, and that is absolutely the worst possible thing to do. The scripture says this in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Say this with me. Darkness causes sin to grow. Okay, that was lame. Let's say it again, can we? Darkness causes sin to grow. And then this, because this is more important. The light causes it to die. Ready? The light causes it to die. This is always the case. When, when we think that, that uh, and the enemy can convince us that we've got it under control and that, that we don't need to involve anyone else, you will never be set free. As long as it's a secret, as long as we keep it in the darkness, it will grow. But you shine light on it, and it will die. So how do we do that? I'm going to give you just one step here. The two verses later in 1 John, 1 John 1, 9, the text says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, well, how do we do that? Which day this week do we show up where one of you is sitting in a box somewhere? Right? No. Nope. Doesn't work like that. The idea of confession simply means this, to agree with God. Confession, biblically the definition is to agree with God. So confession doesn't mean you know, we have to sit down and like, you know, make a huge list with every single thing that we've ever done on it. It simply means this. Uh, you're right, God. You're right. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That was bad. You know, you're right. I'm wrong. We, we agree with God because the thing that trips us up is our unhealthy focus. Oh, look what I've done. Look at it. Look, look. What are we looking at? We're looking at the sin. We're, we're focused on the sin. That's not healthy for us. The th when we agree with God, it's as though we're, our eyes are fixed on Him, and when we, we stumble a little bit, we go, yeah, you're right, God, that was dumb. And we keep our eyes on Jesus. That's how we're supposed to live life. So we agree with Him, and we keep a sustained focus on God, and we move forward. We move on. Check this video out. Have you ever said, have you ever heard, just a little bit, just one more time, it's not 
a big deal? There's a guy, a little over 20, um, in our church plant in Michigan. His mom asked if I'd visit him in jail. Um, he was in jail because he just gotten caught up with the wrong group of people, gotten pretty heavily involved in drug use. And so then it, his life started to look like I, I, I break into places and I steal things to sell them to buy more drugs. And I remember hanging out with this kid a number of times in jail. And he started to read his Bible and he got fired up for the things of God and he wanted his life to be different. And I still remember the, the week he got out and I remember hanging out with him a number of times and him showing up to church for the first time maybe ever and I was so excited. And I actually invited him to Monday Night Football. And he came, and there was a whole bunch of us that hung out with him. And we were going to go mountain biking in a couple days. And it was just awesome. And the day after, we, went, we, we hung out for Monday Night Football. And we were going to mountain bike on, on Wednesday. On Tuesday at about 11 in the morning, I got a call. And he went over to a friend's house. And he was going to shoot up one last time not knowing that the drugs he was using would have a horrible reaction with the medication he was on. And when I got the call, he was blue on the floor, dead. 22-year-old kid whose mom had already lived through the death of two husbands. Now it just lost her son. And again, I, I spent time with this kid almost every day. And and I, I, I mean, I, I knew, I knew it. I knew he turned the corner. I mean, in, in my heart and mind, I am convinced this was just a, I'm not living this way anymore, but, but just one more time. One last time, it won't make a difference. And he's not here. And his mom, even a few years later, is still crushed by this. Well, some of you go, yeah, but you know, I mean, he'd been living that way for years. You know, if you kind of, that's how it works. You start small and it builds up. Not always. Jay Cardi, who's a speaker for Youth for Christ and who played years and years and years and decades ago with the Los Angeles Lakers. He's in his 70s now. I heard him uh, when I was a teenager at a youth retreat, and he actually told this story. True story about a guy who was such a gifted football player that when he was a freshman, he played quarterback on the varsity team. And that year, they won the homecoming game for the first time in a long time. And a, and a, a few of the upperclassmen invited him out. And this was a good kid. He never did, uh, did, did anything wrong, came from a great home, went to church every single Sunday. And, and his parents said, yeah, you know, of course they trust him. Go, have fun. And so he's with a few of his buddies, and they're driving around. And all of a sudden, somebody lights up a cigarette, and they start smoking. And they're like, ah, oh, come on, come on, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. And this kid who, who has, had never done anything out of line in his whole life is like, you know what, I mean, what's the big deal, right? So a couple puffs on a cigarette, probably a lot of coughing, and uh, not a big deal. So he, he does one thing. He really probably knows he shouldn't. And, and Jay, when he tells his story, he says, when you have a one, zeros are nothing. When you compromise what you feel you should do even one time, adding on to it is not a big deal. So a few minutes later, somebody pulls out a bottle of something, and they start passing that around and having a drink. Well, you know, again, it's like, ah, I'm not going to get drunk. It's not, you know, I've never done this before, ever in his whole life. And so as this bottle comes around, he has a drink and another drink, and another drink. And not too many minutes pass, and, and somebody lights up a joint, and now he's already a little bit buzzed from a few drinks, and when the joint hits him, he has a drag on that, and that goes around and around. And then, after they've driven around for a while, they pull into an area where some people are parking, and the upperclassmen open the driver's door and pull the guy out and kind of hit him a few times and throw him off into the ditch. And they pull the girl, true story, from the other side, put a bag on her head, and begin to rape her. One of the kids does it, the other one, the third one. And now it's this Christian kid's turn who's never 
done anything wrong in his whole life. But he's already a little bit drunk and a little bit high. And he gets on top and starts to rape her as well. And she began to struggle. And as she struggled, the bag came off her head. And he looked into the eyes of his sister. What is breakfast like the next day? Or even ten years later? Doesn't it feel like death? Watch this last video. I wanted us to go in that order today because if we would have started with the sin is death and it kills things, some of you may have written it off and thought, oh, that's pretty melodramatic. You know, we're saying this for effect. But sin causes death. It always causes death. Romans 6.23 begins by saying this, for the wages of sin is death. And I'd say it to you this way, you've got to pay for sin. We've all got to pay for sin. And the wage of that, if we choose to sin, and we've all sinned, the wage of it is death. And we will pay for it with the death of our relationships. Anyone have, ever have any kind of relationship diminish or end because of sin? We will pay for it with our physical life sometimes, like, like my friend at our church. We will pay for it with the death of our very soul. Matt Chandler tells a great story uh, about uh, a shoot where there was, it was for suntan lotion, and they had a, a pretty girl in a bikini petting a lion. And when the lion, who was trained and tame, swiped at her and tore flesh from her. In the aftermath, she was crying, saying, I just don't, I don't know what happened. Really? It was a lion. Do you know what a lion is? A lion is what they call an apex predator, which means lion eats everything, nothing eats lion. Okay? And so to think that a pretty girl in a bikini can I sort of, oh, it's a cute lion, I'll pet him without anything ever going wrong is foolish. It's another time we should probably say, stop it, right? Don't do that. 1 Peter 5.8 says that Satan is like a roaring lion who prowls about seeking who he may devour. Sin will cause death. We will die from it. For the wages of sin is death, but the, the scripture continues then by saying, but, oh, right? Anyone else? Yes. Like, is there any other way? Is there any other way this happens? Listen to this. Say it with me if you want. This is the best but in the whole Bible. Right? Yeah, I said it. If this is the best but in the whole Bible. Bible. Because watch what happens. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God made us to live. That's what the whole beginning is about. He made us just as we were supposed to be. He made us to live. Sin only results in death, but the free gift of God is life again. So will you live today? Will you choose Jesus today? Because his work and his love will never fail. And if you're sitting in this place today and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm just a messed up sinner, you're in good company. Because we're all there and we've all been there. But Jesus doesn't want us to have to pay for that because he paid for it. For us. And so if you're here today and you've never experienced life again because you've spent all your life battling with sin, I want to invite you to pray a prayer and start a brand new life in a new way, receiving the free gift of Jesus. And we're going to close today just by declaring.
declaring that the love of God who sent his son to die for us never, ever, ever fails. And so, Father, today we confess to you that we are sinners. We've messed it up. We've missed the mark. We've stomped our feet and gone our own way. And, and God, we know. We know how frail we are and how fallen we are and how broken we are, even though you never intended it to be like that for any of us. And Father, today I pray that, that we would have a very real and powerful sense of sin and how destructive it is, and how deceptive it is, and how it tricks and fools absolutely everyone. But Lord, I thank you today that sin is not the end of the story. I thank you for the but. I thank you for the, the fact that, God, your gift and the work of Jesus is to give us life and life for eternity, in a life that we can start living not when we die, but today. And so, God, for anyone in this place who has never got to truly live, I pray that they would not only confess their sin, but, God, that they would accept the sacrifice of Jesus that pays the price completely and wholly for everything they've ever done and everything they ever will do. And Lord, I thank you in the name of Jesus that your work and your love are perfect and never fail. And that's something all of us want to say amen to. Amen.